I'm pleased to see you tuning in. Welcome to AMS. This is a brief constellation of words ending in AM. A chapter list has been provided in the description for a more guided tour. It actually all started with a conversation between my father and I about spam and expanded from there into this. Let's stroll down the suffix list of silly sayings and multiple meanings. The idiom wham bam thank you ma'am is often used to describe something that was done quickly and efficiently, but without paying much attention to detail or quality. Whether you think that's good or bad depends on the situation. Speed and efficiency. Sometimes the phrase is used to highlight how quickly something was accomplished. Lack of consideration. On the other hand, it can also imply that the task was hurried and careless. The earliest recorded use of the phrase, wham bam thank you ma'am, in the generic neutral sense of speedy, is from an article entitled, Dear Mr. Banker, published in the Greenville News on 14th of January, 1950. The article expressed a wish for banks to have separate line for quick transactions, referring to it as a wham bam thank you ma'am line. Dean Martin also recorded the song in the same year. Nowadays, the Urban Dictionary version describes it as a long term for a quickie. My how implications can change. Speaking of term transitions, Spam is a brand of salty processed canned pork and ham made by Hormel Foods Corporation. It was introduced in 1937 and gained popularity worldwide after its use during World War II. By 2003, Spam was sold in 41 countries on six continents. In the US, Hawaii is the state with the highest per capita consumption of Spam, becoming the most common ingredient in Hawaiian cuisine. Like most hot dogs, Spam is pre-cooked, making it safe and edible to eat straight from the can, but is often cooked further to improve some characteristics of its palatability. Internet Spam became such a huge cultural concept that in 1998, the owner of the Spam trademark, Hormel, published a webpage called Spam and the Internet. It commented on the origins of the term. Use of the term Spam was adopted as a result of the Monty Python skit. Hence, the analogy applied because UCE was drowning out normal discourse on the Internet. We do not object to the use of this slang term to describe UCE, although we do object to the use of our product image in association with that term. Interestingly, Unsolicited emails predate the origin of the spam term. History shows that the earliest known mass commercial emailing occurred in 1978, sent by Gary Thurk to advertise DEC's new VAX computer systems. Due to a large negative response, Thurk apologized and reportedly, it took years before anyone saw a mass commercial email again. So as long as there have been electronic communications mediums, spam hasn't been too far behind. Onward to Pam, cooking spray. Pam was introduced in 1959 by Leon Rubin, who with Arthur Meyerhoff started Pam Products Inc. to market the spray. The name Pam is an acronym for product of Arthur Meyerhoff. I know, right? Who would have thunk? In 1971, Gibraltar Industries merged with American Home Products and became part of the Boyle Midway portfolio. When Reckitt and Coleman acquired Boyle Midway from American Home Products in 1990, Pam became part of the American Home Food subsidiary. In 1996, AHF was acquired from American Home Products by Hicks, Muse, Tate & First, and C. Dean Metropolis & Company, becoming International Home Foods, which in turn was acquired by ConAgra in 2000. What's more amazing at this point is the consolidation of the product into the industrial economy. Delicious! Thanks! I couldn't have done it without Pam. Oh, I thought your name was Chill. Which really says more about the way of our world and the decisions made that create the funnel effect in an upward trend. A more curious question is what happens when the funneling stops? If you'd want to see a video about the corporate and money swell upwards, please say capitalism in the comments. Oh boy. 
Based on its 2021 revenue, the company ranked 331st on the 2022 Fortune 500. They currently pull in a revenue of $12.3 billion. Some of the other brands from ConAgra are your favorites, so watch out. Speaking of highly rated food, Emeril Agassi is an award-winning Creole chef with a dozen restaurants to his name. Yet most know him for his trademark catchphrase, BAM! Just a little BAM like that. Lagasse used the exclamation judiciously on his numerous television shows. But where did it all start? In the mid-1990s, the chef was busy hosting Essence of Emerald, an instructional cooking show. Because of my restaurant schedule, we were shooting eight shows a day, he says. But after we had lunch, people began to start falling asleep a little. At the time, Lagasse was already used to kicking things up a notch. But in order to keep his staff awake on the set, he had to resort to something a little more extreme than flambe. Thus, BAM was born. BAM! When talking about BAM, listen for a flam. The Progressive Arts Society defines it as a particular method for learning the drums, beginning with rudiments and gradually building up speed and complexity through practicing those rudiments. A flam consists of two single strokes played by alternating hands right left or left right. The first stroke is a quieter grace note, followed by a louder primary stroke on the opposite hand. The two notes are played almost simultaneously and are intended to sound like a single, broader note. The temporal distance between the grace note and the primary note can vary depending on the style and context of the piece being played. In the past, or in some European systems, open flams and closed flams were listed as separate rudiments. A rumbling of good noises can be heard at the Trans Am Automobile Racing Series that was created in 1966 by Sports Car Club of America president, John Bishop. Originally known as the Trans-American Sedan Championship, the name was changed to the Trans-American Championship for 1967 and henceforth. The Trans Am was also a specialty package for the Firebird, typically upgrading handling, suspension, and horsepower, as well as minor appearance modifications, such as exclusive hoods, spoilers, fog lights, and wheels. Four distinct generations were produced between 1969 and 2002. Tops. A Trans Am isn't complete without a Fram oil filter. Over 85 years ago, the original chemist Frederick Franklin and T. Edward Aldham invented an easily replaceable oil filtering element at their laboratory in Providence, Rhode Island. Automotive oil filters of various types had been on the market for nearly 10 years, yet were difficult to install, change, and clean. So Franklin and Aldham, whose last names were combined to form the company name, set out to solve these problems with their revolutionary filters. In 1892, the Fram was launched. The ship is both unusually wide and unusually shallow in order to better withstand the forces of pressing ice. Norwegian explorer Fritjof Nansen's ambition was to explore the Arctic farther north than anyone else. To do that, he would have to deal with a problem that many sailing on the polar ocean had encountered before him the freezing ice could crush a ship. Nansen's idea was to build a ship that could survive the pressure, not by pure strength, but because it would be of a shape designed to let the ice push the ship up so it would float on top of the ice. Floating along is easy in a pram. William Cavendish, third Duke of Devonshire, approached William Kent, an English architect known for his Palladian style of architecture, to build him something that would carry his little children. Kent created a shell-shaped baby carriage attached to wheels and could be pulled by a goat or pony using a harness. Most of these prams were made from wood or wicker with metal parts. These baby carriages were called prams or preambulators. The use of prams reflected broad cultural changes concerning hygiene, urbanization, social development, and changing views of childhood, parenthood, and gender. With the introduction of pavement in urban and suburban areas in the mid-1800s, the pram became a practical means of transportation. The baby carriage industry is now concerned with accessories, corresponding with the 21st century's conception of childhood and the various materialistic possibilities in a very differentiated world. Oh, 
Pardon me, madam. Madam is a polite and formal form of address for women in the English language. Often contracted to ma'am, the term derives from the French madame, from madame meaning my lady. Outside the settings of formal protocol, the term ma'am may be used to address a woman with whom one is not familiar. The term is meant to convey respect and graciousness, lightly salted with deference. For example, waiters, store clerks, or police officers may use the term. Unlike miss, the term ma'am tends to be used for older women, which is one reason some dislike the term. Others dislike the term for other reasons, such as the distance it created between the speaker and the person addressed. Others, such as etiquette authority Judith Martin, defend the term as dignified. Martin writes that madam or ma'am and sir are all purpose titles for direct address as a foolproof way of conveying the respect due to people whose names escape you. Speaking of names that escape you, the Theodore Ham Brewing Company was established in 1865 when German immigrant Theodore Ham inherited the Excelsior Brewery from his friend and business associate, A.F. Keller. In dramatic noir fashion, William Ham Jr. was kidnapped in St. Paul by the Barker Carpus Gang in the 1930s. They asked for $100,000, the equivalent of $2 million today. The subsequent investigation by the FBI employed the first attempt at raising latent fingerprints from paper ransom notes, connecting Doc Barker and his gang to the kidnapping. Also, a portion of the Ham's beer jingle was sung by the Three Stooges in the 1962 film The Three Stooges in Orbit. <laughs> While we're on the topic of drink, a dram is a unit of weight in the U.S. customary system equal to 1 1 16th of an ounce or 27 grains, 1.77 grams, or a unit of apothecary weight equal to 1 8th of an ounce or 60 grains, 3.89 grams, or a small draft as in Hitchcock took a dram of brandy, or the Armenian dram is worth 25 cents on the dollar. Or, dynamic random access memory is a type of semiconductor memory that is typically used for the data or program code needed by a computer processor to function. One of the first uses of DRAM was in a Toshiba calculator in 1965, using a capacitive form of DRAM that was made from bipolar memory cells. You don't want to catch DRAM on an off day. When it comes to gram, there are two definitions depending on the context. Number one, a gram refers to a gram of drugs. Two, I don't do it for the gram, I do it for Compton, Kendrick Lamar. Mainly, it is the basic unit of mass of the international system of measurement. It is defined as one one thousandth of the SI base unit kilogram in France. Its name comes from the Latin root gramma. Other funny variations are, an average man weighs 75,000 grams. An old lady who's your gram. Gram, can I have some more food? Gram, can I have some money? I'm broke. Gram, take care of me. Oh my God! <laughs> On January 12th, 1946, Dan Reeves was denied a request by the other National Football League owners to move his team, the Cleveland Rams, to Los Angeles and the then 103,000 seat Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Reeves threatened to end his relationship with the NFL and get out of the professional football business altogether unless the Rams transfer to Los Angeles was permitted. A settlement was reached and as a result, Reeves was allowed to move his team to Los Angeles. Consequently, the NFL became the first professional coast-to-coast -coast sports entertainment industry. The Rams were the first NFL team to televise their home games. In a sponsorship arranged with Admiral Television, all home games of the 1950 NFL season were shown locally. The 1951 NFL Championship game was the first championship game televised coast-to-coast -coast in what is called a program. Also a series of instructions that can be put into a computer in order to make it perform an operation. Or, 
a plan of activities to be done or things to be achieved, or to always do or think a particular thing, although you do not try to, and a thin book or piece of paper giving information about a play, musical, or sports event. Keeping in line with programmable design, a diagram is usually a two-dimensional display which communicates using visual relationships. It is a simplified and structured visual representation of concepts, ideas, constructions, relations, statistical data, anatomy, etc. Diagrams affect the mind so that the viewer comes to understand them, but not in the way one understands words. Visual thinking or problem solving is very ancient and largely automatic. One only has to remember that the brain puts together an image of the world around us based on sensory input, mostly sight. We do not make any conscious decisions. It is done without conscious thought. Diagrams most likely tap in to some of these ancient but largely unknown routines. A material representation could be a cam, which is a rotating or sliding piece and a mechanical linkage used especially in transforming rotary motion into linear motion. It is often part of a rotating wheel that strikes a lever at one or more points on its circular path. Cam mechanisms appeared in China at around 600 BC in the form of a crossbow trigger mechanism with a cam-shaped swing arm. CAM, as an acronym, is computer-aided manufacturing or computer-aided machining in some circles. It serves as the link between CAD and physical manufacturing. It tells the machine exactly where and how to move so that the part is made perfectly to the specs. Another way to send messages is with the use of a telegram, which is a written message transmitted by using an electric device. Telegrams were very widely used because private telephones were not usual. At their peak in 1929, an estimated 200 million telegrams were sent. The idea was developed by the British Post Office as a service for urgent letters. Historically, telegrams were sent between a network of interconnected telegraph offices. As telegrams have been traditionally charged by the word, messages were often abbreviated to pack information into the smallest possible number of words. Ring a bell? The average length of a telegram in the 1900s in the U.S. was 11.93 words. Telegram services still operate in much of the world, and the number of telegrams sent annually has been declining rapidly since the 1980s. What is still in heavy use is AM radio. Red Barbara Sportscaster said this, People who weren't around in the 20s when radio exploded can't know what it meant, this milestone for mankind. Suddenly with radio, there was instant human communication. No longer were our homes isolated and lonely and silent. The world came into our homes for the first time. Music came pouring in, laughter came in, news came in. The world shrank with radio. The discovery that electromagnetic waves are capable of transmitting information sparked the invention of radio. The first successful attempt to transmit audio signals over telephone lines took place in the mid-1870s, and this has been acknowledged as one of the first transmissions taking place with the help of some form of amplitude modulation. Although it is not very popular for music broadcasting nowadays, it is a good option for news, sports, or talk radio. There's so much talk about what to trust on the news these days, you could call it a scam. From insurance fraud, to mail and email scams, to investment scams, fraudsters continue to devise schemes to trick unsuspecting individuals and businesses into divulging sensitive information and their hard-earned money. Now, frauds and scams had been around for thousands of years, and I'm not kidding. The earliest recorded case of fraud occurred in 300 BC. A Greek sea merchant, Hegastratos, took out an insurance policy known as a bottom ring. Well, Hegastratos took out the loan, but sank his empty ship to pocket all the loan money. Ultimately, though, his plan backfired. The sea merchant was caught in the act of sinking his ship, causing him to drown as he attempted to escape. Consumers should stay on watch for those too-good-to-be-true or get-rich-quick offers and 
Be mindful of friend requests from unfamiliar users before mistakenly sharing personal information or sending any money. To go along with the scam comes the flim flam, which means a piece of nonsense or twaddle designed to trick or deceive. It dates from the early 16th century and is probably of old Scandinavian origin, akin to the old Norse flim, meaning mockery. It sometimes appears as flam, without the flim, from the 17th century onwards. Mordecai C. Jones, a self-styled MBSCSDD, master of backstabbing, corkscrewing, and dirty dealing, is a drifting confidence trickster who makes his living defrauding people in the southern United States using tricks such as rigged punch boards, playing cards, and found wallets in the movie The Flim Flam Man. Flim Flam belongs to a category of words known as compound gradational nouns, which evolved by a process that some call reduplication like flip-flop, ding-dong, or zigzag. That information will be on the test, so you better start to cram. In education, cramming is the practice of working intensively to absorb large volumes of information in short amounts of time. Usually, the student's priority is to obtain shallow recall suited to a superficial examination protocol, rather than to internalize the deep structure of the subject material. Cramming is often discouraged by educators because the hurried coverage of material tends to result in poor long-term retention, a phenomenon often referred to as spacing effect. Teaching students to avoid last-minute cramming is a large area of concern for education professionals and profit for educational corporations and businesses. Ideally, proper study skills need to be introduced and practiced as early as possible in order for students to effectively learn positive study mechanisms. And what are we studying for if not for exams? In the late 1800s, Henry Feischel, an American businessman and philanthropist, introduced the notion of examinations. China was the first country to adopt this idea on a national level, holding the world's first exam, the imperial examination. Gradually, the concept of examination spread to other parts of the world and became a crucial aspect of different educational systems. In our modern-day society, examinations have evolved into different assessments such as multiple-choice questions, essay assessments, personality tests, research papers, and term papers. In some scenarios, students are tested with a combination of different types of evaluations. All of the cramming and exams go directly to learning about the world around us and becoming a professional at a given task. Running a nuclear power plant requires the utmost attention to detail. If something fails, you better scram. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC Glossary, defines a scram as the sudden shutting down of a nuclear reactor, usually by rapid insertion of control rods. But where did the word come from? One deeply ingrained legend about the origin of the word dates to the first sustained chain reaction on December 2nd, 1942 at the Chicago Pile, CP1, which was the first atomic reactor developed for the Manhattan Project. Leona Marshall Libby, the only female physicist present that day, wrote in her memoir that it was Volney Bill Wilson who called the safety rods scram rods. Wilson was assembling an electrical panel that included a big red button. Someone asked Wilson the reason for the red knob. Wilson reportedly replied, you scram out of here. And so it seems likely that scram switches all over the world owe their name not to the nuclear industry's later penchant for acronyms, but to the slang of 20th century America. From nuclear energy to the miracle of flight, the 20th century ushered in a world of modernity the human race has never witnessed in recorded history. Many airlines became icons of global aviation, but only Pan Am can claim to have created the scene as we know it. Pan Am came to be in 1927 as Pan American Airways. Most of what we consider the golden era of air travel is based on the image put forth by Pan Am during its peak in the early jet age. You could say the 60s were the Pan Am golden days. One of the staples of the Pan Am success was the inauguration of Worldport in 1960. But other expenses are hard to call more than vanity buys. In January 1991, the company filed for bankruptcy. Delta Airlines picked up most of the pieces, including the World Port and JFK Airport. Today, the Pan Am Meatball still finds the eye of train spotters in the United States after Guilford Transportation Industries acquired the naming rights for the company. A sad fate for the first American airline empire. 
The Pan Am model focusing on luxurious, long-haul operations is rare, but still has its own followers. Over 43% of Emirates operations follow the same format Pan Am pioneered, and the same goes for 34% of Qatar Airways. These airlines make most of their earnings by bringing passengers to their hubs in Dubai and Doha before taking them to their final destinations. They are arguably the leading companies in connecting the western and eastern halves of the globe. Could Pan Am have been saved? Maybe, but it's unlikely. Only two American contemporaries of Pan Am remain alive today, Delta Airlines from 1925 and American Airlines from 1927. And here we are, the final am on the list. I started this video off by exclaiming how happy I am to see you tuning in. I truly am. I am. But who am I? Who am I? And who are you? It's a question we must all ask ourselves and come to know who we truly are as a human. Let's dive in. I am is a theosophical movement founded in Chicago in the early 1930s by Guy W. Ballard a mining engineer, and his wife, Edna W. Ballard. The name of the movement is a reference to the Bible verse in which God replies to Moses, I am who I am. Ballard claimed that in 1930, during a visit to Mount Shasta, he was contacted by Saint Germain, one of the ascendant masters of the Great White Brotherhood. Many occultists believe that this order of spiritual beings guides the overall destiny of humankind and speaks through human messengers. Ballard compiled his experiences in a book, Unveiled Mysteries, published in 1934, and he afterward claimed to receive regular messages termed discourses from Saint Germain and other masters. The master's discourses emphasizes ways for individuals to become aware of their I am, or God presence. The messages received by Ballard suggested that the United States had a special role in the master's world plan. The growing movement was disrupted by Ballard's sudden death in 1939. Several former members accused the Ballards of teaching a sham religion. Others, such as the Etheria Society, pictured the masters as officials of an extraterrestrial government who offer guidance from unidentified flying objects. I Am What I Am is the second Popeye theatrical cartoon short, a humorous variant of I Am What I Am. The source of the quote is the comic strip, Thimble Theater by E.C. Sager, in which Popeye first appeared. Urban Dictionary fires both barrels when it says the phrase, it is what it is, as a trite, overused, and infuriatingly meaningless cliche used by unsophisticated people when all they are offering is a senseless, unwarranted repetitiveness. Who am I to blow against the wind? Paul Simon. I think, on the red carpet, it's a weird, like, who am I? Am I me? Am I them? Kate Moss. Who is it that can tell me who I am? William Shakespeare. On the expression of identity, the question who am I is a direct inquiry into personal identity, existence, and the nature of the self. Who am I is a more direct and contemporary expression of the ongoing journey of self-discovery. On Wisdom and Enlightenment, Knowing oneself is seen as a path to wisdom, enlightenment, and a more meaningful existence. And would you believe it? Those last few statements are written by Chat GPT. I hope this series gave you food for thought or thoughts over food. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, let us know in the comments. Please consider sending some support via YouTube or our Patreon membership for as little as three bucks a month. You'll get bonus footage and other perks of being a wallflower. I appreciate you tuning in. From Minerva and myself, take care of yourself and take care of each other.